Today I'm filming one of my videos about game box. Uh, I filmed a couple in the past and they've been well received. People contacted me uh, because they wanted more and so well I'm gonna give you more video reviews of game box. And I'm really happy to say this, by the way, this good reaction because it's evidence to me that there is interest for this kind of products and the game books are back. There are many signs the game books are back. That doesn't mean that they will ever come back with the same might as they had back in the day. We will not probably have another golden age of game books like in the 1980s, but uh, they're back as a respectable form of expression and a respectable form of entertainment. Think about what happened uh, with the theater. Theater used to be for millennia the main performative art that people uh, would go and see all the time. There was much more theater um, available, many more representations, many more physical places where theater pieces uh, were put on stage back in the day until the 19th century. And when movie came out, people thought that that was gonna kill theater forever. What happened? Uh, theater became a smaller uh, less uh, universally appreciated form of expression. It shrunk, it was downsized, it became a little more um, for uh, more elitarian. I'm trying to, to say it in a way that doesn't sound snobby. Uh, back in the day, you would just go out and watch theater the same way today you go and to a movie theater. Now you have to buy the tickets in advance, you wear your best suit, you look all important. So it's less. Uh, universal as before, but it still exists as a very respectable form of expression. Game books to me are experiencing something similar. After a moment of complete apparent death in the late 90s, they are coming back. And you know that there is interest for game books when game books like these ones are published. When there's a publisher that publishes such such imposing uh, tomes. So if it was just a matter of, oh, it's a moment of nostalgia, you know, Generation X wants to go back uh, to a simpler time. It was just that people would be completing their collection of fantasy, of fighting fantasy books, buying old copies on eBay, uh, which people do. But people clearly are also interested in new stuff. Um, the very fact that these books as physical artifacts exist, that not only are the stories uh, um, being published, but they're also published in physical form, to me is again evidence that there are writers interested in writing these big books and publishers that believe in the project and readers that support the idea. Uh, it to me is fascinating that um, just like it happened with theater, back in the day, before the 20th century, you had a lot of theater because you needed to please a large crowd, and not all of that was good. Uh, with the theater becoming a form of expression for a smaller, more self-conscious uh, uh, group, it also got better. Maybe it didn't even get better, it's just that the, the, the mediocre stuff doesn't, um, doesn't reach the stage anymore. A lot of it, at least. Um, and so it's means fascinating that the game books are coming back and now we actually have some of the most ambitious books ever published. Now that there is a smaller but very self-conscious group of adult readers that are interested in the form. To me it cannot be a coincidence that we have to wait until the 21st century to have um, a new longest book, a new longest game book. This book that I'm holding in my hand, which is The Heart of Fire by Michael J. Ward, is about a 700 pages long and it's 895 sections long. This, this makes it the structurally longest game book ever and most likely also simply the, the longest by, by word count. I'm not aware of any book, of a game book that is longer than this. The distinction of being the most structurally complex game book of all times used to go to to this book here, to uh, The Crown of Kings, the fourth volume in the Sorcery miniseries, and uh, um, as part of the fighting fantasy line, and it had 800 sections on top of the beam, as you can see. So fewer sections and also shorter. 
this one also is pretty lengthy. This one is I uh, Winter's Fury and it's uh, 780 paragraphs. Eh, so short, but still pretty imposing. Uh, I realize now I haven't even told you what these games, what these books are exactly. They're part of the Destiny Quest line. Right now the Destiny Quest series has three volumes. The first is called Legion of Shadow. I don't have it with me because uh, I'm traveling these days and I had completed that book before I started the trip so I thought I wouldn't drag with me because it's pretty big. Actually that book it's even bigger than these. Not just thicker, it's not thicker than this one. It's simply taller, it's a larger format. These books came out a little smaller. So the first is Legion of Shadow, the second is The Heart of Fire and number three is The Eye of Winter's Fury. They are fantasy uh, stories, they are set in the same naughty world with some recurrent characters. They are not a single story like you have for example in the Long Wolf series. Um, the three books are three different protagonists with different backgrounds, different backstories, different uh, challenges. Um, but as I said, there are, there are definitely references between books, uh, some characters that come from come back uh, to into a new book after a previous one. So there is a sense of continuity and overall shared identity that the series has. Destiny Quest series by Michael J. Ward. Let me show you the box a little more up close to show you how they are, you know, as products, but also. Uh, to show how they work is game box. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the talk a little bit about the game system, and then we can come back here and talk more about the box in general. The Destiny Quest box are large volumes that is just a pleasure to hold in your hand and to browse, flip through the pages. Just ah, a certain delight in the material aspect of these two tomes. They have gorgeous cover illustrations and they are paperbacks, but they are really solidly made. I don't know if you can see, I think you can, from the spines. These spines took a lot of love from me. Uh, I perused the books intensely and the books are still in perfect shape again you can see the marks on the spine but it's not I haven't had any problems like with pages detaching or even threatening to detach like it happens sometimes with paperback books once you spend a lot of time with them. Uh, there are no illustrations, so I should say, well there's some small illustrations here and there, just smaller decorations, I'm looking for one to show you, and of course I cannot find it, which maybe is also a sign that there aren't all that many, but something that you probably saw as I was flipping through the pages is that the few illustrations that are there are usually functional, uh, because they represent puzzles that you must solve, uh, so maybe visual puzzles, uh, or they can be functional to represent the mini games. For example, this is part of a system of paragraphs of a net of paragraphs in which you're playing a game that is reminiscent of poker. So you see the chips that you have, and then you can choose what to do with them to discard, to draw, uh, things like that. And here's another. Another page, another paragraph that relates to the same situation. But, uh, you don't have uh, large, impressive illustrations like you had, for example, back in the day in the uh, fighting fantasy books. However, you do have maps. Uh, these are pretty important because in this game you will navigate a landscape and the story will be divided in a number of acts. This book is divided in three acts. So you start the story here and you're navigating through this map here. You can move freely from any location to any location unless there are restrictions specified in the text. For example, sometimes you reach a location and it says, well, before you can get here, you need to complete this or that quest. Otherwise, you simply move from location to location. So when you reach a location, there is a paragraph number that simply indicates the paragraph that you turn to to resolve the situation. And so basically you have a map, and from each of these numbers there will be a branch of options, an arboreal configuration of paragraphs departing from here, giving you choices, uh, providing you with challenges and fights, fun stuff. 
So here we have Act 1, the map for Act 1, then we have Act 2 and Act 3. Not too many spoilers, but really, you can look at the maps uh, at any time during, um, during your experience and the maps do not tell you too much about the story. As you can see, the locations on the map are, col are coded with different colors and that tells you the nature of the quest represented by that location. Uh, some quests, uh, well the quests proper are, link are linked to colors that indicates the difficulty and nature of the battle. So you can navigate wherever you want, but usually you want to you will want to take your quests in the order from easiest to toughest. Team Battle is a game variant that you only have in this book and that allows you to fight against a big monster with multiple heroes, including possible possibly a hero from the previous book. So there's freedom here, but in most cases your initial freedom is between uh, which of the easy quests you want to take and then which of the hard ones uh, or the slightly or the average, then hard and so on and so forth. You also have legendary monsters uh, if you are courageous and you beefed up in your previous quest with powerful items. Maybe you want to take on some legendary monster that will probably uh, give you some really cool treasure. And also each map has a boss monster, one of the many elements that these games borrow from video games. Of course we had boss monsters back in the day too before video games, but we didn't call them that. And boss monsters uh, are the final battle of each act, meaning that they do not just represent a battle, they also represent a particularly important node in the story. You have a lot of freedom here, you can visit locations in various possible orders, then once you get here you will have not just a main battle, but you will also have a development in the story. Imagine the story starting from a single point, the origin, the, the beginning paragraphs of the, paragraph of the story, branching out in various ways so that there is interaction there, you can choose where to go. And then it kind of like narrows, it goes to a bottleneck represented by the boss battle and the following section. Then you enter Act 2 in which again you have freedom to roam around, wander around, see and experience stuff. And then again at the end of Act 2 the story reaches a key point and again it departs from there gives you freedom and then converges in the epilogue. This is the same structure that you have in all three books which gives you a good balance between uh, freedom to experience the world in an interactive and reader uh, centered way and at the same time you still have an overarching organic story that develops in a logical way. Um, the difference uh, between the previous two books and this one, which is the third one, is simply that here you only have two acts. The two maps are not printed in the middle of the book, like they are here and in the previous book, but they are printed here on this cover and here on this other cover, which incidentally uh, reminds me of the old fighting fantasy books, especially the British editions. The British editions had a color map also here on the back of the cover, uh, back of the front cover, uh, which is something American editions did not have. They used to have uh, uh, black and white maps and also Italian editions that they used to read back in the day also had black and white maps. So if you ever picked up a British edition, maybe this will remind you of that golden standard. So this for the physical format of the books and the general idea of traveling around the land and how it works. Now about the game system. Your hero will be represented by a hero sheet such as this one. There is one in each book but you will not use it. Why would you if you are the serious gamer that you probably are? You will want to photocopy the uh, hero sheet in the book or simply download it from the website so you can have a clean one to use during uh, during your adventure. This is how your adventure sheet will look at the beginning of the adventure before you start and this is how it probably it will look at the end. Pretty messy and worn out. Yes, this is the actual sheet that I used during my The Eye of Winter's Fury adventure and this is how it was at the end. Granted there are a lot of numbers here that I used to 
record stuff during combat, doing some of the combats. I didn't have other uh, places to write at the time, so I used here. Then you have a lot of keywords and other notes here. As for the parts that are functional to the story, this is what really matters. The attributes. Speed, probably, no, I'd say quite certainly your most important attribute in the story. Uh, well, um, life points are also pretty important, health, because if they go to zero, you die. But speed is crucial for speed tests and for combat. You really need this for combat. Uh, brawn and magic, you will specialize in one of the two. Brawn is simply uh, raw physical strength. Magic is your ability to inflict damage through magic. Yes, this is very specialized. This indicates your ability to inflict damage. Because even if you're a fighter with a lot of brawn, you can still use a lot of spells, enchantments, runes, and stuff like that. But the specific uh, key cast <laughs> magic that allows you to inflict damage is represented by a factor here. Armor represents your ability to absorb damage. Now, you're probably thinking as a fighting fantasy reader or RPG player, you're wondering what are your initial stats, how do you calculate them? Easy. They're zero. Zero for all of them. Health? No, you start with some health, you start with 30. And during the game, uh, during the books, which are also games, you will upgrade your stats through physical upgrades, through equipment. As you can see, you have several slots indicating places of your body where you can carry and equip items. You also have the backpack to carry some extra items. So they're indicated in the book as items that go in the backpack and again limited amount of slots there. But very important are the items that are actually actively equipped on your body. So you can have a cloak, something to cover your head, a helm, a cap, whatever, a mask. Gloves, main hand, left hand, something to cover, protect your chest, talisman, feet, a slot for a necklace, and up to two rings. Very important, so when you get a new item that will give you some benefits, for example, say you get a plate of armor that gives you a armor of plus two. So you write plus two A, and here we record, and now you have an armor of two. Uh, then you get a sword that gives you plus one brawn and plus one speed. Then you got the one and one. Then you get something else that gives you plus one brawn. Now your brawn total is two. Um, you can only carry one thing in each slot. So actually if you get a new awesome weapon that needs to be carried with the main hand, you need to erase the one that you had there, write it there if you decide to equip the new one that you found, so the lost one is lost and also the corresponding benefit. So if I have a sword that gives me a plus one and I get another one that has a plus two, I don't get to plus three because of that. Because I lose the plus one, I have the plus two. So I get two plus whatever else that I get from any other slot. So the advantages from items that you discard are lost. So there is, this is why uh, my record sheet here looks so well bad, so used, because actually I replaced items many times as I went, as I got better ones, or also as I was able to modify and upgrade equipment. Sometimes you will find runes or glyphs or enchantments that allow you to give new attributes or better attributes to the things that you already have, so you simply add in more abilities. As you can see, many... Uh, many items will be defined by the description, the name that the weapon is, stats, for example, this one gave me plus two speed and plus three brawn, and then one or several abilities. The game has a lot of abilities that you and your enemies will use, and when I say a lot, I mean it. You're thinking a lot of what's going to be like 20? I don't know, I haven't counted them, but there is a section here with a list of all abilities that you and or your your enemies may have and what they do. And this is the section. So you can see small types and I'm going through it. I ain't reached the end yet. Not there yet. Nope, there's more. Here we go lot of abilities for a lot of incredible stuff. Heal, some of the classic ones that you expect, then ice-based stuff, weaponry, armor, 
from magic, mystical stuff, nasty combat moves, psychological intimidation, and other ways of gaining tactical advantage. A lot of stuff. And yes, most of these abilities are things that you use in combat. So maybe you will find a weapon that has plus two and the retaliation ability and then you'll get another one that has a plus two two and has a charm ability or has a might of stone ability. So um, you will have choices there and other times maybe you will have a weapon that has a phenomenal numerical bonus say plus three speed. That's really good um, and nothing very important interesting in the special ability department and then you'll get a weapon that has plus two speed and some really powerful ability so there's another interesting choice there you're gonna keep high stats and a less interesting less powerful set of abilities or um, lower stats and better abilities higher stats worse abilities um, also some abilities can be used in combo so it's really cool like in video games really to put together combos of abilities uh, so that the effects build up and they create some powerful nasty surprises for your enemies um, this sheet of paper here is slightly different from this hero sheet. This is the one that applies for book one and book two. Uh, this one is slightly different. It has two different boxes here uh, called death penalties and defeats. And these are, I'm not going to tell you what these are for. It's part of the story. You will discover it as, as you go. Actually, this book here also has another sheet for other stats, which again, I'm not going to introduce to you because you will learn as the story progresses, which is good. It's a sort of like progressive way of learning the game. So you do not have to sort too many rules at the beginning, but also really um, those rules pertain to situations that will be unlocked as the story progresses. So I don't want to give you spoilers there. You'll learn about them when, when you need to learn about them. Um, so, a lot of interesting stuff here. This box here, um, for the abilities, is where basically you can write down the same abilities. I didn't do it very well, meaning from time to time I'll write some ability here coming from the items as a reminder, but usually I will simply go through um, the items to make sure that I have the stuff that I want to use, and then to remind myself, oh, I have that ability, I have the piercing ability, I'm going to use that. Um, uh, what I did record here, um, on top of some reminders from this section here, is some other abilities that came from other sources, special moves, special other stuff. Death move, this is something that you have in this book only. I can tell about because this, this one is explained in the initial rules. Death move is simply a special ability that you gain and you can implement in a combat with multiple opponents. When you kill one of them, then you immediately get the benefit from the death move. Again. Think of video games when you have the big spectacular finish, the special mini sequence of actions, hack slash, pull off the head of the opponent, throw it at the next enemy. That kind of spectacular gory stuff that you have in video games. Um, this is what the death move is meant to capture. In my humble opinion, that's how I saw it at least. Name of your hero, well, that's uh, pretty standard, uh, or not so much. In this book, for example, you're supposed to be Aaron the Prince. It was a little generic to me, so I decided to call myself Esteban the Magnificent. Yeah, you have to admit it has a different ring to it. I also gained some titles as I went through. Path, this is really neat. You start as, as a dude. That's just like a boring, oh, gray, pale... Uh, playing there, you don't have much of a personality, you don't have a training, you don't know what you're doing. In many cases, you don't know who you are. One of the premises of the first book is that you have the hugest amnesia, amnesia that ever exists, that you have no idea who the heck you are, and during the adventure and your peregrinations along the map, you're trying to put together clues to figure out what you are and who you are and what you should be doing next. That is from the Legion of Shadow. Later, so you just start as a generic adventurer, you're trying to get equipment to build up your strength and your abilities. Incidentally, you may have noticed that's how you get your abilities. Your, ability co your abilities come from your items. You don't exactly you know, level up intrinsically. Of course, you have to see this as, a, as an abstraction. Gaining certain objects means that you gain certain experience, not just that the item allows you to perform certain moves. But 
This is how it works. When you're naked, when you're taking a bath, all of a, all of a sudden, you are just as weak as you were when you were born and before you gain the good stuff. Then you put your stuff back together and you're again Terminator. But as for your personal past and your training, you don't have uh, any specifically, you don't have a training. During the story, you will be given the choice, uh, at an advanced point of the story, around a third of the story, you'll be given the option of choosing a path. You can choose one of three professions, rogue, warrior, or, or, or mage, or wizard. And uh, depending on which stats you have and your uh, style, you will choose the one that you think is best for you, which will allow you to equip certain items rather than others. Or certain items are specific for certain paths. Certain abilities can be acquired only by certain kinds of people. And then also later, later still in various parts of the story you may have a chance of specializing so depending on the path you may gi be given a chance of of earning or of, of learning more specific skills maybe you're a rogue and you learn the skills of the beggar or the skills of the shadow stalker maybe you are a major believe and you can be the witch finder or other types of like the elementalist the illusionist um, Actually, you may be given various choices of career and then you may decide for one and then later you decide for another one. They all have to be consistent with your path. If you're a warrior, there are several paths that you can take and you can take one after a while. Uh, you have certain careers after a while, you don't like it, you get a chance to learn a new career from somebody else. You can change your career and each career comes with benefits and abilities that you will add here. For example, in my The Eye of Winter's Fury, I was a warrior, and as a warrior, for a while I was a were-warrior, so I could turn into a big scary bear, uh, and then later I was offered the opportunity to become a storm carl, um, and that seemed much more interesting. The storm carl has some really powerful combat ability that I like, the hurricane rush, the spin shot. Um, but I didn't like the name, I don't know anybody, everybody named Carl, so I decided to become a Storm Bob. Because I know a Bob, he's a nice guy, he's a friend. Hey Bob! And as a Storm Bob, I really had a heck of a good time using my, my special abilities. I also could have become other types of warrior. Had I been a rogue, I would have had other, other career choices available. As you can see, a lot of ways that you can used to customize your character. Your character will grow through upgrades, abilities, equipment, uh, backpack item, uh, will mm, evolve during the story. And actually seeing your character uh, starting from a completely clueless, useless waste of space to a, to a big epic hero is one of the biggest satisfactions of this box. As for combat, and let me look for one that I can show you. It's funny, right? I I faced dozens of fights in this game. Of course, I can't find one now to show you and to save my life. Oh, this is a pretty basic one. Uh, that can be good to show you how it works. Um, the enemy will have a speed, then brawn or magic. Remember, brawn or magic are used only to inflict damage, so um, they only need one. You when you're fighting you will use whichever is higher brawn or magic from your sheet armor and the health each turn you roll 2d6 for yourself and two for the opponent and you add the speed if your die roll plus speed is higher than that of the opponent you want the combat roll if the opponent has a die roll plus speed which is higher than your die roll plus speed then the opponent won't combat if it's the same nothing happens which is not always, uh, well nothing happens, it means a tie, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that uh, nothing happens, because there may be effects that happen every turn, every combat round, so even around where there was a tie, the effects still happen. So you or the opponent usually will win the combat, when, well the combat round, then you roll a single die, a d6, for the character that won the combat round, you add the brawn or magic, whichever is specified for the opponent, if the opponent is dealing damage, or the brawn or magic for you, whichever is higher, um, 17 or 2, ah, uh, tough choice, uh, I'll add the 17. 
a d6 plus brawn or magic for you and that represents the damage that you inflict that the opponent is inflicting on you of course oh look at this now we have another enemy that the opponent inflicts on you or that you inflict on the opponent once you have the number of damage points inflicted on one of the two sides the side that is taking the damage reduces that by the number of armor points and that is the actual amount the remaining amount that needs to be deducted from health say i rolled a modified uh, 10 my opponent after taking all modifiers into account has rolled a total of 11 darn they win because they were faster than me higher speed they rolled the die uh, they roll a four they have five in bronze so that's nine I deduct 5 because of my armor, I take a lot of 4, which I deduct from my health. If I go to 0, I'm dead, which uh, at least here the uh, author doesn't tell you, like they say in other books, go to, you need to go back to the beginning, because you know the really players, readers actually do that. They may record how many times they died, but why would I go back and read 600 paragraphs um, for punishment for a bad roll? Here the uh, author tells you, if you die, well, you respawn, just like in video games. Uh, that is, you go back to the beginning of the encounter, you can try again. The penalty is that you have consumed all of your uh, consumable items. If you drank a potion, you drank the potion that is not regenerated with you. So actually it is still more punitive than a lot of video games. You simply go back to the previous checkpoint. And... So, um, or you can simply decide, yeah, you can decide to go back to the beginning if you want, oh, I don't know, it's your book, you paid for it, you do whatever you want with it. But this is how combat in general works. Now, there are a couple of combats, I should say actually, there are many combats that have special circumstances. Here's the combat I showed you earlier. Special circumstances, they make things much more interesting. Because, for example, you have multiple enemies and then you have special abilities that will apply. For example, here, at the end of each combat round, each opponent will deal, which heal themselves for two health. So this is one of those cases where a tie uh, may not be all that good for you. you. Don't take damage, you don't deal damage, but they're feeling better. Maybe there are cases where you're inflicting, uh, say, a bleed damage uh, that then will give... Uh, automatic damage to the opponent at the end of each combat round, then a tie is not that bad for you because you're bleeding out the opponent. Um, outnumbered, uh, this happens many times that you have multiple opponents because contrary to what happens in movies, multiple opponents don't don't put themselves in a nice line and attack the, the hero one at a time. This is much more realistic. So here at the end of each combat round you must take a damage from each surviving opponent ignoring armor. So if there is three of them, then I'm automatically taking three damage. Again, another reason why in a combat such as this one, ties are not all that good. They're pretty, pretty, pretty damaging, actually. Uh, there are other cases also, you see here, they have all the same abilities. Where you have multiple enemies and they will have different abilities. So actually there is another interesting wrinkle that is, um, you decide which one you attack first. Because maybe you have three enemies and say one of them, has cast a spell, as long as that enemy is alive, the armor of everybody in the group is very high. The other one has cast another spell, and as long as he's alive, your speed is reduced by two. And then the third one is just really nasty and keeps hitting you uh, and giving you damage each turn. Hmm, now you have an interesting choice. Are you gonna uh, take down the one that once you kill him, everybody's armor will be lower? Or but you'll be weaker in the in the meanwhile or you're going to take out the one that is weakening you but everybody's armor will be nasty will be still very high sometimes you have some of these helpers that give you these negative effects and then you have the big boss uh, that if killed will will end the combat so you don't necessarily need to to kill the helpers so again you can choose to kill all the helpers but then you'll be consuming some of your resources and abilities and then you're reaching the big guy, which doesn't have the advantages of the helpers, or, so as you can see, pluses and minuses, you're reaching a weaker boss of, the, of that encounter, but when yourself are partially exhausted, or you take on the big boss immediately, you ignore the helpers, but of course, at that point, you're fresher, but also the big boss has all the advantages coming from, from the helpers. This is a very 
common situation. Also something interesting and again borrow from video games, don't freak out, this is unusual. Uh, after fight your stats are back to normal. Just like in video games you see the energy bar that broop, goes up after a fight or in games like that are alive or injustice and simply between encounters even though the encounters may take may have only occurred minutes apart you're back to your former glory all of your health is restored so it didn't freak out when batman was back to full health between two two fights in the injustice video game then don't freak out in here if here the same thing happens your character uh, recovers all health at the beginning uh, of the next combat or say at the end of a combat recovers all abilities usable items are gone of course but other than that um, like in video games what matters is really that you make it alive until the end of a fight so if you have healing potions so you drink them during combat there is no reason to drink them after that an unusual idea that you do not find very often in game box but one of the many ways in which i think video games that originally threatened i say probably originally killed the first generation of game books actually then can partner with new authors uh, to bring new ideas to the second generation of the game book um, form now, I haven't told you about the stories much, if anything, but the, the reason is I don't want to spoil the stories to you, but um, I still feel that I owe you a little bit of an introduction about the topic. I'll, 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 I'll sketch out the overall plot, no, the overall initial situation of all books, so you know if there is one of them that is particularly interesting to you without giving any spoiler in the first book legion of shadow you wake up one day you have no idea who the heck you are um there is a mark on your body that you think um, has something magical to it as either you're thinking cool i'm harry potter um no you aren't but discovering who you are is part of the story um we'll leave it at that because as soon as you start finding out new stuff then spoilers right there the second book, Heart of Fire, is uh, well, it's pretty peculiar. The situation opens with you being tortured by the Inquisition. In this book, you're cursed or blessed, depends on the point of view, with visions. You're a prophet and the church uh, doesn't like you very much for that, but at the same time, uh, they decided they, they can use you as a sort of like a forecast for things to come. So you're being tortured and interrogated in the prison of the Inquisition. Definitely, while well, a fantasy book, this is one that seems to hint uh, the history of the Inquisition as we had it in, in our real world. Uh, there is a bit of that element of an oppressive, dangerous uh, religious system. And actually, in this story, then you get you don't get tortured. It's not torture porn for like seven hundred paragraphs or eight hundred ninety five paragraphs. Uh, you get freed from the prison, and you wanna get the heck out of there. You wanna go away from your captors, and also the other stories that well, let's say that your visions have to do with a demon that may or may not show up one day, and you start traveling around, seeing if there are ways for you of avoiding the arrival of the big demon that will bring the end of the world and all that bad stuff the demons usually do in fantasy. The Eye of Winter's Fury, again you're given a name, you're Prince Aaron and um, you're sent on a diplomatic mission and as soon as you go out on a diplomatic mission of course things go completely, um, completely few bar and uh, uh, bad stuff happens, let's just say that you start traveling in the north it's a snowy, cold north, uh, full of wild people, proud but savage people. Uh, it's, it, there is definitely is um, is an element of Song of Ice and Fire here, the ice part, basically. Uh, you have a little bit of a sense of the Night Watch, there's a group of soldiers that is guarding the north, so there's pretty much the night watch here. Again, you have the wildlings, uh, they're not called like this in the game, in the book. So it's kind of like a mix between that and then there are also a lot of references to Norrin mythology. So if you're familiar with that, some of the monsters, some of the creatures, some of the names come from that element. So, which basically is kind of like one of the original fantasy worlds. So there is that, that aspect that the two elements are combined. 
it's hard for me not to tell you much, but, uh, but this is sort of like Thor meets Jon Snow kind of story. Okay, um, done with the embarrassing part in which I'm trying to tell you about the plots without telling you about the plots. Uh, overall, these are really good books. This is a fun read. Uh, it's a refreshing, um, exciting read that I think will please all nostalgic fans of game books. And if you never tried any, um, this could be a good place to start. The game system is not hard, but it's engaging, fun, um, a lot of options, a lot of things to do. The stories are well written. The prose is pleasant, so it's a prose that really gives you a good sense of the scene, which is so key in game books uh, and in interactive fiction in general, because you need to be there. The book needs to give you the sense that you are the hero. And, and the writing style of these books does this very successfully. I loved them. I liked all of them. Probably the one I liked a little bit most somehow is The Eye of Winter's Fury. I think that uh, the author went uh, further in the idea of embracing intuitions from video games uh, instead of just trying to share away from them. I think it's a really good, fun game book with a lot of game culture out there, references to pop stuff, but they are blended in, they don't distract you, they're amusing without being problematic, without really destroying the immersion. Destiny Quest by Michael J. Ward. Three good game books that I recommend to anybody who's interested in this form.